step one, then trip over the mic for um, uh, Let me just ask first, uh, Naran Sahami spoke, I think, two or three weeks ago. Uh, did he put on a good show? <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, Naran and I used to uh, teach together at Stanford. He's an incredibly gifted teacher. And uh, I used to get good evals when I would teach, but then I taught with Naran. And uh, one of the evals was uh, Naran Good, George Bad. <laughs> so this, this is my chance at redemption here. I'm going to see if I can um, pull it out for you guys. Um, so I, I think the goal uh, was to talk a bit about um, uh, you know, what led me to uh, a STEM career myself in computer science and then AI and, uh, and even um, advertising and media. Um, and then I'll also try to give some uh, perspective on artificial intelligence more broadly um, and then give some uh, kind of closing uh, advice in the Q&A. So jumping in. So, um, so uh, you know, our brains uh, learn and adapt the most when um, you know, there's something really emotional uh, that uh, you know, we, we accomplish. And um, uh, for me, my first uh, engineering accomplishment was actually uh, disassembling the little kid safety gate that my parents used to keep me in my room. Uh, so I, 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 apparently, I, 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 so I'm told, I couldn't actually walk yet, but I spent a lot of hours studying this thing. And it's just bolts, you know, with a little nut, and, and I was able to kind of get it off. So that was kind of the first uh, time the universe told me, you know, if you just study something, uh, try to figure out, you know, the mechanisms, how it works, uh, that can be really rewarding. Um, and for reasons I don't understand, I was in love with technology as a kid. This is uh, not exactly the same unit I have, but a very similar one. I, I was just in love with this calculator. So I was born in 1970, so like state-of-the-art tech was a calculator that you could hold it in your hand. Um, and even had a cool little leather pouch that you put it in. Um, it kills me that there's actually a manual for <laughs> uh, what people were looking for, but uh, just in case you didn't know how the percent key worked, I guess that's, that's there for you. Um, so somehow or another, I was wired to kind of really like electronic things, and I like things that I liked, I wanted to understand and take apart. So um, my, I, was, I was a troublesome kid for my parents, because no toy really survived very long uh, before I was disassembled, and sometimes I could get them back together, but more often not. Um, and I was really inspired by um, uh, you know, the arts, I guess, right? So um, the, uh, in my uh, day, it was sort of you know, the first generation of uh, Star Trek with Captain Kirk and Spock. And um, somehow as a kid, um, like first grade, I mean, it was really inspiring. There was just something uh, just that provoked so much imagination uh, to me about uh, not just the whole Star Trek thing, but you know, traveling through space and whatnot, but even, even just the, you know, the image of the future of uh, they had a ship's computer and it would play three-dimensional chess of some sort against Spock. And that was just wildly um, uh, intriguing to me, this idea that this computer uh, could talk to you um, and you know, play these games against you. And um, I, there was one episode where the, computer's, uh, the ship's computer got sick and Spock knew it because he could beat it in chess, because normally the computer always won. But that was weird, because at that time, of course, no computer had ever beaten a human in chess. Um, but uh, you know, things have moved along uh, since then. So uh, my, I mentioned um, you know, my mom was getting sick of me taking toys apart, so she decided to get me a toy that was already apart, and the, the trick was to put it together. So uh, I played with a, a lot of these uh, little electronic kits where you wire them up and uh, you make different things. Um, so that kind of solved um, my... Uh, I didn't, so this, this old electronic kit, it doesn't even really have anything that we would think of as a CPU. I think there's one integrated circuit on there um, that has, I think, one OR gate and one AND gate or something like that. So you can't really, <laughs> there's not a lot of computational horsepower there, uh, but still, as a little kid in first grade, I would wire it up and randomly talk to it and pretend I was talking to the ship's computer and the little random static I was getting back, I thought was sort of it answering in some sort of Morse code. So uh, my, my joke was, you know, I, I tried to build AI uh, back then and I, you know, it didn't work, but I got better at it over time. Um, the, uh, this is funny, this is an ad that was just, can you imagine a kid just uh, like drooling over this ad, uh, I think I was eight, uh, when the Radio Shack TRS-80 came out, and uh, the, uh, it's funny to see what um, advertising, you know, imagine the marketing geniuses that came up with, uh, you know, uh, software includes floating point basic and ROM commands, new list, run, continue, remark, left, or next. I mean, just, they're just like listing all of the, the key syntax, I guess, in the basic interpreter that it comes with. Um, but for me, that was awesome. And um, it's interesting, like, there, there's no web back then, right? So it's like, clip and mail this coupon today, and they'll send you more information in the mail uh, a few weeks later. Um, it's kind of interesting as well that uh, among the value propositions on the left, um, you know, that first bullet, um, you know, wired and tested in the second bullet, not a kit. So this is. This is actually kind of new, right? Because before that time there were computers, but they only came as kits uh, that you had to put together. 
So I never got one of these. Uh, my, my story in life was always being slightly disappointed by what my parents were able to provide. Uh, it's, it's not that they didn't give me a computer, they got me a different kind that I didn't actually uh, want as much as this one. But anyway, it, you know, it worked out okay. Um, so uh, I guess it, uh, maybe like you, like you get exposed to a lot of new things, and um, uh, the computer was kind of fun, but it, you had to have a ton of imagination, and, and more than I had uh, in sort of junior high and high school, to figure out what computers were really good for, other than playing games, which was cool. Um, and, but in high school, I got really motivated by chemistry. If you, if you kind of like, if you're a person who likes order in the world, right, but there's nothing better. You know, it's just like, here's the guy with two protons, the guy next door has three protons, and the next guy on the list has four. It's all just, you know, um, you can know anything in a column, kind of react similar to anything else in the column. It's beautiful, and it's, it's, it's fun to start doing chemistry experiments, and you're like, you know, it's, uh, maybe it's, it's too far to say it's, you feel godlike, but it's just amazing to be able to, like, do this stuff, and then it, you know, like mixing uh, different uh, compounds, and it comes out the way, you know, kind of the math and, and the theory uh, predicted. It, it was really cool, and so I, I, I got really excited in, about chemistry, and I always thought I would be a natural scientist. I pictured myself, you know, in a lab coat with uh, protective eyewear, um, and, I, and I never thought I would really do uh, computer science, because that sort of seemed like this dirty, um, more of a handyman kind of thing almost than, than sort of real science. Um, I changed my views on that, uh, so I got a job uh, for a summer working in a lab uh, they were trying to measure how kidney cells regulate pH. And uh, you know, a lot of medical work, you have to attach some sort of radioisotope, put it in place of the normal element uh, for some reaction to occur, and then by, um, you know, honestly, with a Geiger counter, basically, you know, measuring the radioactivity coming off, you can know, for example, how much radioactive sodium uh, you know, a batch of kidney cells absorbed over some period of time. And um, my job was to, uh, there was this, it was before they had robotic uh, labs, so my job was to, there was like this grid of, I don't know, 300 little test tubes, and I was supposed to grab each one at different points in time, uh, shoot in a little bit of thing that would, would stop the reaction occurring, and then later we would measure it uh, under this, um, uh, this, essentially a Geiger counter to see how much radiation. So I'm, each one of these 300 test tubes has radioactive sodium in it, and um, the first one, I, I, the, uh, my boss was there uh, for my summer job, the first one I tried to do this thing with, I, just radioactive sodium just squirted all over the place. <laughs> and so uh, he was, um, he was uh, Russian Spanish, and I just remember his, uh, I can't quite do his accent, but it was something like, your hands are now radioactive. <laughs> and so um, uh, there was, I was wearing gloves and stuff, but still it's like, you know, I never had these worries with computer programming, you know? And um, uh, also I didn't realize it's, it's interesting doing internships, you know, and kind of getting a view of day in the life because um, you know, in a lot of these, biological labs, not to turn anybody off of like curing cancer or something, but you know, the, the day in the life uh, when you're working with radioactive materials is you're like underground, or if you're above ground, there's like foot thick concrete you know, walls around you, there's no windows, you can't, you couldn't have a window because what if you sloshed radioactive sodium <laughs> off the window? So it's, it's a dreary environment, not to mention the, um, the risks. So anyway, as I was doing that, I also had a summer job um, writing computer programs to help a startup um, try to understand if they were to provide uh, phone service in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, in Texas where I grew up, um, uh, I was writing software to figure out, well, of all the places you could, you know, throw down a, a fiber optic line, like what would be optimal, um, and like save the company the most money, but still connect uh, all the businesses that they needed. And so that was actually kind of like a, the first time I knew that there was like cool computer science that you could do. Um, and again, there was uh, no health risks involved. <laughs> so. Um, that was the summer before going to Stanford. Now, somehow or another, I, so life seemed to be telling me, you know, computer science is exciting, uh, chemistry and biology is dangerous and, uh, and, and dreary. <laughs> but I, I, when I got to Stanford, I still wanted to do uh, chemistry. But somehow, I don't know why, um, it occurred to me uh, that I should go uh, to the library, at least to have uh, old exams at the library that you could see for different classes, just to get a sense. And I thought, well, why don't I go and see, like, whatever the last courses I would be taking as a senior, why don't I go see what the final exams look like, so I can see if this is stuff I, I want to know. And I, I just, I, you know, it's not that this isn't important, and there's patterns to it, there's beauty to it, and all that, but I, I was just looking at it, and I thought, I don't, I don't want to know this, you know? <laughs> so, um, and, and meanwhile, um, uh, on the computer science side, um, at Stanford, they had great instructors, and I was loving the classes, and it, it was the kind of thing that, like, when I got the homework, for most classes, you know, you look and see when it's due, and then you plan, do I have enough time the night before <laughs> to do it? And with computer science, I was just getting the assignment and going and doing it, like, minutes after class was over, and it was just, it was just fun. Um, and uh, it was an interesting time, um, so this is, uh, I started Stanford in 1988, 
Um, you know, it was an interesting time when uh, you know, uh, personal computers were still kind of on the rise. It was still somewhat uncommon uh, for someone to have a personal computer. And so like, with a new science like this, like, there, was, there was so much that was like, sort of interesting and unknown. You know, so like as opposed to chemistry, where it's like you know we we got it, you know we figured it out. <laughs> here's the table, uh, and here's the periodic table. Here's how things react. Here's how you know that previous slide on how organic molecules react and where the you know, tighter bonds are and whatnot. It, the other other uh, disciplines, it, it just seemed like everything was just known and it was processed. Like they're, they're just telling you what you know they already know and other people figured out. And in computer science, in particular, artificial intelligence. So this guy John McCarthy, um, uh, he passed away just a few years ago. Uh, but he looked more or less like this when I was at Stanford. Um, he, uh, he was actually the guy who uh, came up with uh, the name artificial intelligence and kind of started this whole field back when computers were ridiculously, I mean, not that they weren't much more powerful than that hand calculator I showed you. Um, but even back then, it was kind of amazing that people started to think, you know, I wonder how far this could go. You know, I wonder if you could program computers to uh, do things that humans do and, and, and learn as humans do. Um, so uh, McCarthy was. Uh, uh, a professor, uh, he taught uh, AI classes, but he also taught this cool class called uh, Technological Opportunities for Humanity. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it was about what at the time seemed crazy to us, but basically like the first week in class was his idea about drones to deliver things to you. This was like in 1988 or 89. And we're all thinking, this guy is so crazy. <laughs> this is, I don't know, this is, people actually called this class Uncle John's Mystery Hour. But you know, in fact, of course, now you know Amazon, Google, and I don't know what other companies are working on how to have drones uh, deliver things to us. Um, the only difference is uh, uh, McCarthy didn't imagine flying robots. He thought they'd just be kind of walking along the sidewalk, and then he had this crazy idea that somehow people might not want to share an elevator with a robot. So all buildings would have these weird handholds on the outside, so the robots would <laughs> walk along the sidewalk and then start climbing up the side of the building. You know, I, I picture this robot, you know, tapping on your window, like here's your pizza. Um, but Anyway, he was a nice guy, and so as a freshman, I asked him uh, just to explain AI to me, and he actually just took me to lunch at the faculty club and kind of laid it out, and like, here's all the things that uh, people are working on. So that was just inspiring um, to, to think about a field where there was so much that was still you know, yet to discover. Um, and it was, again, it was, it was just fun. Uh, this is a screenshot, it's not the exact program, but um, uh, one of the funnest programs that we worked on as freshmen was um, uh, just a little 3D tic-tac-toe player. It's like the regular rules of tic-tac-toe, but it's four by four by four. So there's, it's more complex, you know, the ways you can win. And uh, the irritating thing about the program, like even, even I wrote it, but it would still, like I couldn't beat it playing it. You know, and it would sort of taunt you, like I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna win in eight moves, or you're gonna lose in eight moves. Because, you know, it's small, uh, we would say in AI, it's a small search space, right? The computer can easily imagine every possible move carried forward, you know, uh, far into the game, much further than a human could. And it just knows at some point, you know, I've got even eight moves. I might win faster, but at least eight. And um, it was kind of my first experience, kind of going ahead to have a computer that was smarter than me. Um, that was, I, I, I see, I'd had that before, because there were chess computers at the time, but I had never written the program. <laughs> There's something weird about writing a program that's, that makes you look dumb when you work with it. Um, so, so I guess you could take that two ways. One is you could uh, be angry, but uh, I was sort of, uh, that was uh, more inspiring to me. and made me want to explore AI further. Um, so uh, the guy on the right here is Nils Nilsson. Uh, he became uh, pretty famous uh, for working at SRI, the Stanford Research Institute. And then he was the head of the computer science department at Stanford. And uh, he became my advisor. Uh, he was in color by that time, but I chose this picture of him. Um, the robot in the middle is uh, shaky, and it's kind of interesting um, how far certain things went, um, even back in um, 70s and 80s. Uh, shaky was uh, so named because it, it moved rather abruptly, and it was top heavy, so it would shake uh, as it uh, rolled around. Uh, but it was one of the first systems that combined um, uh, vision, uh, natural language understanding, and uh, a robotics platform to sense and affect the environment. So you could tell it uh, to go to the room and put the red block you know, on the table, and it would, it would do that. Um, so uh, when I was working with Nils, uh, Nils had actually written a book in, uh, I think it might have been the 1950s or early 60s, called Learning Machines. And um, it's kind of funny, we don't have the best names for things in computer science. Um, Actually, the, the main journal is called the Association for Computing Machinery. It just sounds like uh, horseless carriages, you know, uh, there's got to be some new name. So uh, machine learning seemed weird, like I said, when I picture machines, I just think of oily, you know, things with gears and, and whatnot, and maybe scraping noises, but um, uh, machine learning is just what it was called, this idea of like, how do you program uh, machines, computers, uh, to learn. And sort of the canonical problem is, is kind of like this, where uh, you're given a bunch of examples, where each row might be one example of, of something. 
the, the long string of ones and zeros at first is like how you're measuring something, right? It's maybe an image or um, it's a, an advertising problem. The ones and zeros represent uh, what you know about, you know, let's say, a web page. And then the, the question, the final one or zero is, well, if I show this ad, uh, you know, will they respond to it? Um, and this is the way the world looks to computers. They used to have all this data, and then you get all these questions, like the, at the end, okay, well, here's a new thing. Like, what, you know, what, what's the right thing? Is it one or zero? Um, usually at this point, I like to taunt the audience by saying, you know, do any of you have ideas? And then someone just says something, and then of course, it's either one or zero. <laughs> so, so the important thing isn't whether it's one or zero, but uh, does, do any of you see a pattern um, that you know, gives you confidence in whether it's uh, a one or a zero for that last row? Okay, there's the, there's the unknown. Um, it's only when I hit page down that the universe resolves and uh, we know whether it was one or zero. Um, well, so there, uh, a hint is that, uh, in fact, it's only the first five uh, bits that matter. The rest were all irrelevant. Zero. Someone thinks it's a zero, but why? It's an even number. Uh, what do you mean by even? Um, like if you go, Oops. the top one is one, 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 three. Okay. The second one is one, 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 three. Four. Three, three, three. Okay, okay, so we got a, we got a, uh, somebody who says it's three. Interesting. You know, I never even noticed that myself. It is, uh, I meant to make it three or more, uh, but in fact, uh, I guess this data only shows it being three. Yeah, so, so that's it. Um, so in this case, then the final one would be zero because the first uh, five, you only got two ones among the first five. Um, so now this was easy because it was just the first five, but you know, in a normal machine learning problem, I mean, there's millions of these things, right? So um, you've got to develop machinery uh, to look through that. Question in the back? Um, I was reading an article just the other day and talking about machine learning. There's a uh, the scientist, I can actually add his name right here, um, Mario Kren. Uh, I'm trying to, I don't remember what, what lab he was, oh, the University of Vienna. They were working with quantum mechanics and he was trying to find states of photons using laser and mirror experiments. And he was just working on it and he realized he was just guessing after a certain point. So he made a, uh, a program, a learning program to try to figure out the state for him. And he just kind of left it on overnight, came back and it worked. So we've, I think we've reached the kind of the point where there's some stuff that's non-intuitive for humans mm -hmm. that we might need learning computers to help us get the grasp of because it just it doesn't work at all like you think it should yeah i think th there's a lot of environments where um uh, maybe kind of the old approach was you know you've got a team of human analysts you say all right you guys go figure it out and what do they do they put some data in spreadsheets they look you know is it this factor is it that factor that matters um, maybe they do some sort of hypothesis test you know, with statistics as they're doing that, but they're still kind of looking at maybe one or two variables. Um, and um, yeah, for a while with machine learning, even the machine learning systems weren't that much more sophisticated than that, so maybe you wouldn't find gaps. But now, uh, particularly with um, you know the deep learning, just the, kind of the more modern algorithms, um, the the likelihood that you're missing something if you're not trying them is very high, and it's actually getting easier and easier uh, to try them. Yeah, I didn't actually put in any screenshots of what some of these uh, deep learning libraries look like. But um, what would be a good analogy? I mean, it's like, um, well, it's almost like kind of the kit computer versus that just buying a MacBook, right? <laughs> so, uh, so when I was in school, basically, you had to write your own code if you wanted a neural network for something. And now, uh, you know, Facebook is eager to give you theirs. Google is easier, eager to give you their TensorFlow. There's a, a Theano. Uh, so there's all these cool libraries uh, for machine learning. So I guess whenever you're in a situation where there's kind of data and an outcome, uh, you know, more data and then some outcome, and you want to try to figure out what the model is, right? What, Either for two reasons, right? One is you've got a new situation like this and you want to know what the outcome is, or you, you're trying to drive some outcome, like I want the X experiment to succeed. <laughs> so, and you want a model saying, you know, what, you know, under what circumstances will that happen? It can work both ways. Um, and I actually, this, uh, there was a book uh, that a friend of mine wrote called The Master Algorithm, um, which his, his point was basically like, once we solve this, you kind of solve everything because it's, it's so general purpose, uh, these machine learning uh, techniques. So, um, so my point here is, so previously I just had these strings of ones and zeros, right? So what do these things represent? Well, wrong key. Um, so, you know, in a self-driving car example, that, that long string of ones and zeros might represent, 
um, you know, the input to the, the self-driving uh, car of like where are the other cars or you know, maybe here's some computer vision on things that we think are the stripes and the lanes. And then that final zero or one is the control action. Like, should I slow down, speed up, turn left, turn right, hard brake, you know, what, what should I do in this situation? Um, the self-driving cars, uh, sort of like, like this, um, self-driving cars learn a lot from just having humans drive uh, to create training data, right? So they, they have this giant database of like, oh, well that time before <laughs> when the car in front of me was decelerating abruptly, you know, the, the guy you know, slammed on the brakes, so that's what I should do now. Um, so, uh, you yeah, know, we're for online ads. So, um, uh, for online ads, that you know, those ones and zeros, you know, these these might be a bunch of different people, you know, seeing an ad. The ones and zeros talk about uh, what's on the page, what that user searched on, maybe, and then that final one or zero is what did they respond to, you know, this particular ad. And the control then is so should I show them the ice cream ad or the BMW ad or just maybe nothing at all. Um, even farming. Uh, so there's a company called uh, Blue River Systems. Um, they uh, actually started in a, a Stanford class that I was uh, a mentor of a, of a different startup team. Uh, there's a Stanford class called the Lean Launchpad, and um, the, uh, it's kind of a cool class. So uh, teams come together with kind of an idea. They think, well, if I build this technology for this kind of customer, it'd be amazing. And so the class is actually all about you know, how wrong uh, entrepreneurs usually are <laughs> with that first idea. And the whole point of the class is getting out of the building and doing interviews with prospective customers. So um, uh, Blue River had ideas around uh, certain things that you could do in farming, and eventually by interviewing people, they kind of were told, no, we don't even care about that. But if you could, um, like for, for initially for organic farmers and then later for lettuce farmers, they said, you know, it's such a chore. Um, you can imagine, okay, so imagine you're a lettuce farmer. <laughs> so you've got dirt and you've got lettuce seeds, you know? And um, you, know, you can throw the seeds all around. Uh, well, okay, so you can throw the seeds all around, and then uh, different lettuce plants grow, but you can imagine, of course, like here and there, you've got four seeds that were all in the same spot, and the lettuce plants are kind of growing on top of each other. Maybe none of them ever gets healthy because they were all competing uh, for both water and sunlight. Um, but every now and then, you get one nice little seed that's just, it's got its own spot. It's happy. It just grows into a nice, happy lettuce plant. So they actually built an AI system to do crop thing. Uh, so it, it's this thing you attach to your tractor, and it drives over, and as it sees the ground, it's actually doing classification, like, is that a lettuce plant or not? And then it's got another routine that says, are these plants too close? And if they are, uh, one version of it used to zap one of the plants with a laser. And then uh, the new one, they just found that it's actually uh, slightly more effective just to spray a little micro patch of uh, herbicide on the one plant that you want to kill. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, uh, they can also do other things like detecting pests. And instead of fumigating an entire you know, acreage with uh, some pesticide, again, you can just have the thing roll over and, and shoot like teeny little microbursts. Uh, right at the bugs, so it's kind of cool. So, so this stuff can be applied uh, just in, in so many areas. Um, I was going to try to do a teeny bit of kind of academic -y stuff. Um, um, I don't know. Anybody here know uh, conditional probability? A little bit, and then uh, naive Bayes classifier. Uh, so this will be this will be exciting because um, the whole point was uh, if you already knew it, it would be sad. Um, so you know, I'm just in here. Okay, good. On the screen, it kind of shows up. So. Um, so I, I took just the first five uh, from that data I was showing you, and we got to have names or something, so if you just call the first five bits A, B, C, D, and E, and the last one is Y, um, then this is that, that data. And then you can just make uh, inferences by just counting, right? So what's the probability that A is one? Well, there's eight of them, and it's one twice, so that's two eights, and B is one is uh, five, and so forth. Um, and then conditional probability says, well, okay, so this is how the notation reads, and it says what's the probability that Y is one, you know, conditioned on or, or given that A is one. And so that just means, well, okay, so let's pretend there's a new universe, a new universe where we throw away everything except for where A is one, and then you ask, well, well it's probably that Y is one. So in that universe where A is one, that only has two rows then, or two, you know, examples of data, and Y is one in one case and zero in one case, so then that would be a half. And then similarly, probably A is one given that Y is one is, is one third, because in that universe where Y is one, uh, we only have, oops, I guess I, too lazy to get the last row. <laughs> so, there's uh, only three uh, rows or examples, and in those three rows, A is one only once. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, you can just count and get these probabilities. And then using these, you can begin to try to answer questions that says, well, um, you know, for that last row with the zero, one, zero, zero, one, blah, 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 what's that last thing going to be? Um, in conditional probability languages, it's, it's what's the probability that y is one given that a is zero, and b is one, and zero is zero, and b is zero, and b is one. So um, this is um, 
I use this new sort of equals um, you know, this uh, with uh, something called Bayes rule. There's a denominator that I threw out because it turns out not to matter in this case. Um, and uh, that's just flipping the conditional probability. It's a very um, powerful thing uh, for any reasoning about data, uh, this Bayes rule. Um, and then that sort of equals if you assume things are independent. That is, you know, if, if it's not, it doesn't matter that, that all these things take on these values at once, but what matters is just like just the interaction between A and the output or B and the output. Then it, it equals this, this multiplication of, well, okay, so this, this sort of equals probably that A is zero given that Y is one times probably that B is one given that Y is one and all the rest. Um, and then that's back to just counting land again. We know how to do that from before. So this, our system, this system would say that uh, rough probability that, that uh, Y is one is about 0.1 to three. And then you can calculate well, what's the rough probability that Y is zero, and that would be 0 0.0576. And then someone smart enough to say, wait a minute, uh, Y can either uh, only be either zero or one, so how can the probabilities somehow add to only about 0.7? And that's because of that denominator thing I said I threw away. <laughs> it turns out, you know, if, if this is the relative probability of, uh, of being zero or one. So in this case, it would say that the higher number is on zero, so the computer would have, would have guessed zero. Now, it didn't have any sense about its three, um, so it didn't have a model, but it looked at the data, and it's sort of competent um, at, at making these guesses, um, even though there wasn't very much data there. And so that's um, one type of, of classifier that, um, um, you know, a lot of machine learning people will try on a problem uh, before they get to kind of bringing out the big guns and uh, more advanced algorithms. Um, let's see. So, um, in terms of other things you can do, um, so Jim Simons, uh, I guess at the time I took this screenshot, which has been a while, it was worth $12 billion. He used to be a math professor at Stony Brook in New York, and then he said, uh, uh, you know, being a professor is kind of cool, but I, I think I want to be a multi-billionaire. <laughs> he started a hedge fund. Uh, that was all about using artificial intelligence and machine learning to trade stocks. There's a lot of hedge funds uh, that claim to do this. I don't know if you guys have you know, thought about um, uh, when you get older how to invest your money and whatnot, but um, uh, you know, there's a school of thought that says you know, that everything's all random, just you know, buy the S&P 500 index of you know, the, the top uh, companies and don't even try. Um, somehow or another, uh, these guys uh, at his company called Renaissance Technology have been delivering you know, significantly higher returns for about 20 years now. Uh, nobody knows what they do, it's very secretive. Um, I actually applied for a job there, and I was offered one back in uh, 1996 um, when I was finishing my PhD, and it was, um, uh, it's, it's hard to learn about a company. It's, it's totally right for them to be secretive, uh, but it's hard to learn about a company you know, when you're kind of a fresh grad looking around, uh, you know, when they, when they are so secretive, but it's very, very, very smart people. Um, uh, so, uh, also, I guess with machine learning now, I don't know how many of you saw this. Uh, in the old days, uh, when chess was kind of the big deal, um, by the way, I should, I should do a little quiz. Um, okay, so take checkers, chess, and uh, go. Um, I guess I presume everybody knows checkers and chess at least. Um, so uh, I guess raise your hand if you think uh, a computer can beat a human at checkers now. All right, there's uh, most people thinking. Uh, and then anybody guess, like, what year do you think, uh, you know, checkers fell uh, to the robots? 1990? Um, yeah, it actually was around 19, uh, somewhere plus or minus a year, I can't recall uh, the exact date. But there was a program called Chinook, and um, the way they programmed Chinook is they actually had, um, there was Chinook and another program, I should have mentioned Backgammon, Backgammon, this also um, was lost to computers in the 90s too. Um, the way they did it is they just had the computer play itself sort of until it got bored, uh, which never happens, right? So it just kept going and going. And uh, then it would do machine learning on, well, you know, this position I was in this one time, you know, was that a win or a loss? And how can you, it's an interesting question, maybe you don't know, was that one position a good position and, and like you were gonna win? Or was that one position actually just sort of mediocre or even bad, but you got really lucky uh, going forward. You can ask that about any point in the game. There's, there's kind of this magic uh, formula for, for propagating um, like the final win back through time. It's called reinforcement learning, and in particular an algorithm called Q-learning. So when you have computers uh, play themselves, they do have a way of kind of figuring out what was it that they did that was good. Um, so uh, for, <coughs> excuse me, um, and then chess, I guess folks, folks mostly know, you know, um, IBM won against uh, Gary Kasparov in the 90s. Um, and then it was funny, at the time that that happened, um, AI has this thing people call the moving frontier problem. Like whenever a problem is solved with AI, people say, oh, well, that wasn't really, that, you know, you don't really need to be human intelligent for that. That was just a thing, you know. <laughs> and they point to whatever we haven't solved yet. Like, that's the thing. And so 
Um, you know, when, when checkers or backgammon just don't have chess, you know, they'll never beat us at chess, and then, you know, only about five years later, uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess, and they said, oh, well, there's Go. You know, chess is a small game, honestly, you know, it's pretty easy for a computer, but Go is just so hard, uh, they'll never win at Go, and then, actually, just um, today, this uh, news came out about uh, Google reinforcement learning system uh, beating the Go champion. The, the champion is on the right, the, the guy on the left is just uh, reading what the computer says and putting uh, stones on the board. So. Um, so it, it's interesting to wonder about like what you know what uh, can't they do? Um, the um, generally like when you've been in this enough, you mentioned um, you know this one scientist having this epiphany that maybe I should try machine learning. Um, when you've been in this enough, you, you see just a lot of human endeavors um, that you know maybe a normal person would just you know see someone making a pizza and think ah oh. you know you can, you can almost smell it you know. Uh, but you know I think if you've been in AI long enough, what you really think is you know there should be a robot for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know why? You know why should we have the pepperonis be randomly distributed based on how the guy was feeling that day? Maybe one guy got 17, the other got 19. Like surely there's an optimal number of pepperonis. Can't we just you know A/B test it like Google would and uh, and, and discover it? Um, so there's there's just a lot of things that um, uh, that, that that turn that way now. Um, one other thing that computers are getting really good at. So you know people said okay well maybe these games you know they're they're kind of this limited environment. Um, surely you know natural language and all this richness. Um, uh, computers won't, won't figure out. Um, maybe you can kind of read. Uh, this is um, some, some charts out of a study a project at Stanford uh, called uh, uh, GLUB. It's um, uh, this uh, word vector um, uh, assignment. So what, what's, what it's showing is um, after simply throwing uh, massive amounts of uh, text at this learning system, it begins to understand uh, similarities uh, between words and kind of the, the nature of these similarities. And so you can tell it, okay, I want to see you know, words in two dimensions, just kind of plot them. And the interesting thing is, so like here, um, it's got uh, king and queen. You'll notice kind of the same thing, but male, female. It's got sir and madam, again, kind of same sort of you know, honorific uh, address, but male, female. It's got heir and heiress, again, you know, lucky person <laughs> inheriting money, uh, male or female. It's got man, woman, brother, sister, nephew, niece. So somewhere or another, the thing figured out that these are all kind of the same thing, but just gender differences. And interestingly, you can you can kind of do addition uh, in this space. So like um, I said, I didn't write it out. But basically, you know, king minus man plus woman equals queen, right? It's uh, if you if you think of these as uh, vectors, this this man to woman vector you know, plus king gives you queen. Um, and similarly, over here, it's it found similarities between. Uh, you know, words denoting degree and sort of the, the comparative the, uh, to the superlative, right? So you've got uh, slow, slower, slowest, short, shorter, shortest, strong, stronger, strongest, they all have the same curve. So the thing is, is, is learning this notion of, of degrees of comparison uh, and senses of words. Um, oh darn it, okay, I overdid it with um, stretching <laughs> that quote. Um, this is a, a quote by Samuel Butler, which uh, it's sort of, it's a funny quote on the nature of AI, because then people start wanting to debate, well, what, what's AI anyway? I mean, if you just run this database through a thing and it says, well, men, women, king, queen, I don't know, is that AI? Um, is it really intelligent? And there's this hilarious quote uh, that I guess I get to, to say, uh, which was, uh, even a potato uh, lying in a dark cellar has a certain low cunning about him. Uh, he knows perfectly well what he wants and how to get it. And then it actually goes on to describe another you know, potato if there's a teeny little ray of sunlight, you know, it'll start making a shoot that starts to try to, you know, catch some of that light. And meanwhile, you know, little roots are sprouting. And if there's any gradient of moisture, those roots are going to go in the direction of that moisture uh, to get water. So it's I just I just love this quote that a potato has a certain cunning <laughs> about him. Um, so I guess the point is right. If, it's, if there's a task to achieve, the potato can achieve it. So to, in some sense, I guess it's smart. And but it, it sort of uh, it, to me it illustrates the difficulty of, of trying to say you know what intelligence is. Um, and it's funny how attitudes about intelligence have changed. Like, so when it was, it was like mind-boggling when uh, Deep Blue did beat Kasparov in chess. But it was funny. Uh, IBM, uh, you know, the marketing machine started uh, reminding everyone that they had beat the world chess champion 15 years ago, um, a little while ago when it was the anniversary. And uh, in the comment thread, someone says like, "Why so much drama? It's a human versus a machine." You know, someone else said like, "You know, do we?" Uh, um, oh, was it there? I forget. It's, it's, someone else was saying, "You know, do we do we get all bent out of shape when a car you know outruns a human?" And it's just weird because that this this is this moving frontier problem again. That, that that's not the way we used to think about it. Um, interestingly, uh, just navigation, which everybody just has on their phone or maybe in your car, um, that used to be like research uh, that PhD students would do back when I was in school. Uh, that was like the hard thing. People talk about how do you get from MIT to Stanford, and 
uh, figuring out either use of interstate highways or perhaps uh, airplane schedules. That was like a big deal <laughs> to do. And now it's just there. And, and kind of the weird thing to me is, um, if you think about what's intelligent in driving a car, it would seem to be like the cognitive task of planning, you know, I'll go here and turn, I'll go there and I'll take the highway. And then that feels like the intelligent part. And then just not running into anything on the way, like, that feels like the easy part, right? But the weird thing is it's, it's actually uh, the inverse and it's only now that we're getting, you know, through Tesla and Google, the, the full sort of self-driving car effect. Um, and that's, uh, you know, people sometimes talk about AI and they, there's different ways of thinking about it, right? On one hand, uh, you know, oh, brave new world, you know, that has such smart uh, robots in it, you know, it'll be amazing. Um, actually, the title of a book that came out last year was uh, Machines of Tender Loving Grace. <laughs> it's part of a, a poem uh, that uh, a poet in residence at Caltech uh, wrote some 30 years ago. Um, but sometimes people worry about AI, like, ooh, you know, what's, what's it going to do? But I think, you know, it, for sure we can disagree. Like, it's cool if people don't die um, in cars. Um, and uh, it's just weird that, like, within our lifetimes, uh, what what safety means in cars used to be the top. Like, safety meant when you, you know, when an inattentive driver plows into, you know, something solid, safety means uh, the car is designed in a way so the forces get uh, transferred to the outside, you know, the wheels and whatnot shoot out to the side rather than, like, you know, severing the legs of the driver. Now the car just sort of says, nope. <laughs> I don't want to crash, uh, no, no thank you. Um, and, and that's just going to be more and more of a normal thing. Like right now it's really on kind of the, the higher end, but that's going to, you know, just like other safety devices, the anti-lock braking and so forth got more common that will too. And, um, and there's all sorts of work that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine anybody, uh, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, wanting to do that, that AI can automate. This is um, uh, Kiva Robotics Systems at Amazon. Um, in the old days, you can imagine Amazon, like they have these distribution centers that are the size of multiple football fields. You know, somewhere there's a guy and there's a printer, and the printer says, go get item from, you know, row 38, you know, shelf Z2 or something, and off he goes on a scooter uh, to go get that thing. Uh, now at Amazon, you don't go anywhere. The robots bring shelves to you. <laughs> and it's actually, you might expect, okay, so the robot brings the shelf, but probably there's some screen that says, we'll get something out of, you know, bin number 12D. It doesn't even do that because I guess humans made too many mistakes. So what actually happens is a little laser pointer squiggles on top of the thing you're supposed to grab and then put it in the box. Um, so all you're left with is like an eyeball and the ability to do like fine grasping, which you know it's only a couple of years until uh, that is likely. Um, so maybe I'll skip a, a couple of things here. Um, I find uh, so you know, getting back to science and can can AI accelerate that too? Um, I just find these really cool. Uh, they're um, uh, micro satellites as part of um, a, uh, a gravitational study NASA was doing. Um, those are the actual like little satellites uh, next to a quarter, <laughs> and um, uh, the, the, the task was to design an antenna. You can imagine with that little mass, uh, there's not a lot of battery power uh, to be you know, transmitting signals. So the task was to design an antenna uh, with maximum uh, gain and uh, an AI system uh, using uh, genetic algorithms, which are a way of like, trying a lot of things, but kind of you know over time, much as, as the way um, you know, some species maybe can evolve to live better in their, their niches, um, these things were evolved uh, to have the best gain in a simulation. Um, let's see, there's all sorts of cool things. One of my favorite companies is Taco Copter. It's cool because it, it doesn't actually exist. Uh, the website does, and you can order t-shirts. <laughs> I, I give them credit because I think it was uh, 2012 they launched tacocopter.com. Uh, with this kind of uh, fake uh, app where you just you just touch a button and the, the idea was that a copter would bring you a taco, um, but like that's totally going to happen. <laughs> so um, they they were ahead of their time. Um, somehow I, I, I'm excited by food applications. This is a hamburger manufactured by a robot at Momentum Machines in China. They have robots that can deliver them to you as well. Um, I guess we also have uh, Jeopardy. So it's no fun to play against computers when the, the task is to understand a knowledge base and be able to answer questions about it. Um, a friend of mine started a company called Savioki. Um, the idea is you're in a hotel, you need a bottle of shampoo. Why well, have a person, you know, run all the way from the desk, uh, to get the elevator, get to the floor, and head back? Uh, they just have robots that uh, do that. Um, funny thing is, they mentioned uh, their robots have actually been attacked <laughs> by uh, um, uh, men wearing, I guess, uh, uh, what would you call it, a tank top, uh, you know, t-shirt kind of thing. Um, I get, the weird thing was, uh, th these guys attacked it. I think it had an ice cream inside, so they. You know, they made off with the ice cream. Uh, but they, they said the, uh, the weird, I guess maybe they thought something more valuable was in it than an ice cream bar. Uh, but the funny thing was, he said they attacked it and kicked it and were mad at it for some reason. But then one of them put it back upright at the end. So I, I don't know what that means. Um, and uh, let's see. There's some, 
Uh, you know, again, so part of the point, uh, or part of the benefit of all this is, um, you know, awesome technology saves lives. Um, Wall Street Journal had an article about this, um, essentially a, a robot that replaces an anesthesiologist for certain operations. Uh, so it had, you know, one more, one more white collar job, so it had to be killed by computers. Um, it's interesting, the, the, um, uh, this robot, it's just, uh, by itself, it monitors certain vital signs, and just, you know, on its own, it decides if you need to kind of give relatively more or less, you know, of the uh, anesthetic uh, to keep the patient comfortable. Um, it only works for a certain class of operations, but within those classes of operations, it completely replaces the anesthesiologist. Uh, there's still a doctor there, of course, but not, a, not an anesthesiologist. Um, so there's some books that have come out, if, uh, if you guys are curious on, on more automate this, uh, Racing Against the Machine, or, or a couple that talk about um, uh, just examples of automation and then kind of a, a broader view on um, you know, changes to society. Um, there's been some headlines, so these are a little while ago, but um, <laughs> Jimmy Fallon Robots Take Over, there was actually an article about a robot comedian, um, and then um, uh, The Atlantic had an article about uh, you know, the robot we'll see you now based on you know, IBM Watson and what, this, what does that imply uh, for the future of healthcare. Um, the, um, you know, I guess, again, part of the benefit, uh, we hope, is that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work uh, that's very satisfying and that if people enjoy doing it, you know, why should anybody tell them you shouldn't continue doing that? But, you know, certain companies and individuals can overdo it, right? There's actually more, but I've only grabbed a couple of uh, stories of just people working themselves so hard. Uh, you know, they've even passed away. In Wall Street, it was, um, it, it got to be so prevalent that they were just known for working the younger kids to death. Um, so I don't mean that literally, but I guess it, you know it, it did actually result in the demise of some of their younger employees, the, the long hours without sleep, uh, working on um, you know under client deadlines. Um, so you know if we can instead have uh, AI, you know what does that mean? I, with the company I founded called Rockfield, um, you know what we heard from our customers were kind of the opposite. Like the, the AI gave uh, one guy he said more time to spend with my wife and young family. Um, a woman at an agency and an ad agency in New York said I can go home now before it's dark out and maybe get in a run. Um, other folks talked about the freedom to spend more time, but exploring things and learning new things. Um, so I think that's kind of the tell, I think, when uh, AI is working. So this is my advisor, Nils, back when he was in color. Um, uh, we were at a conference once, and he just kind of leaned back in his chair and said, you know, the point of all this is to spend more time at the beach. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you can get these robots to, to do some of these things for us. Um, yeah, a little bit on um, you know, where that story led uh, for, for rocket fuel. So we went public in uh, 2013 after starting the company in 2008. And um, essentially from a... Uh, you know, I had never really planned on um, doing anything commercial. I always thought I would be a uh, scientist, but um, one of the reasons I ended up going into business was uh, as I was uh, in my PhD uh, doing some internships, I just discovered that uh, what was happening in industry was just so far behind what we were doing kind of, you know, in the lab at Stanford. It just seemed, like, wrong. Like, why would you spend even more time in the lab uh, to create an even bigger distance between what people are really doing in the real world and, you know, what we know we could do? Uh, it seemed like the right thing to do was to try to bridge that gap. And um, I guess the, the lesson was it, was it was very rewarding to do that. Um, the uh, uh, company went public. Um, we had, um, it's funny, I, when you go public, you, it's so funny, just, I, if, if, if I'm this computer scientist who's mostly kind of sitting behind some monitor, you know, writing code, all of a sudden, you know, I'm on TV. <laughs> I'm uh, sitting while some lady does my hair so I look cool. Um, and uh, so it, it's funny, I guess um, my, my point with this is it's not to brag, but to sort of just observe the sort of um, humor in it and say, um, even those of you who are focusing on STEM, uh, you know, if it, if it works, you basically never, you, you never uh, uh, will fail to benefit from just uh, thinking about communications as well. Um, uh, you know, presenting yourself uh, and, uh, and speaking, uh, presentations and so forth. So I was uh, putting in a plug for that along with, um, along with STEM. And finally, so uh, there was a request for some advice. Um, so uh, my first provocative advice is find smarter friends. And uh, I, don't mean, I don't mean smarter than you have now, I just mean smarter than you. Um, so um, so it just, it's, it's such a good heuristic um, you know, to, to improve yourself by having friends that challenge you. Uh, Maron, I mentioned, who spoke here before, Maron was way smarter than me. And, uh, but I tried it as often as I could to be on you know, the project teams with him at Stanford. And somehow or another, you know, I tossed in a good joke once in a while and he would you know, you know, allow me to stay. Um, but like, it, it just, it's, it's very helpful. Um, Second was, uh, I said, teach and help. Um, there's so much you learn by teaching someone. I, I think here maybe they have tutoring, I, I think, for students, but if any of you get further along and you're good at stuff, I really encourage you to find opportunities uh, you know, to tutor younger students or you know, students who are newer um, to some of the classes that you've taken, because you learn so much. It, it activates a whole different part of your brain you know, when you're trying to explain something to someone else. Um, be humble is just, I, there's just so many opportunities to learn things, and um, 
yeah, a first reaction might be, you know, man, that guy is weird. I don't want to work with him. <laughs> but you know, if the second if the second reaction is, you know what, you can learn something from everybody, um, you'd be surprised how many people that you might not have really kind of clicked with initially um, that you know become important to you. Um, I had be optimistic in problem solving. I, I think particularly in STEM. And so I was thinking, um, I took a class once, an AI class, with a guy named uh, Maritz, uh, who's uh, Danish. And uh, it was like 3 a.m. and our, our program still wasn't working. <laughs> it was supposed to be, it was kind of a silly thing. Uh, we were building an expert system that was supposed to be able to diagnose avian botulism. I, don't ask me why, but, um, and it was 3 a.m. and it wasn't working. And he's like, man, you know, my friends who are doing history or English, they do not have this problem. <laughs> just, you know, your essay is done when it's done. Maybe it could be better, but it's, it can still be done, you know? And it's just infuriating, you know, that on the tech side, like, something isn't done until it's actually correct, right? Um, but I, I think what I've seen, not just in, in you know, myself and our employees, even in people we interview, um, you know, even when you get interviews, right, that you get there's all these puzzles, right, and it's like, oh, no, I don't know how to do it. But you see people, like, there's definitely people who have that as their first reaction, and then they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, let me just try, and then, you know, what if I do this, what if I you know, square up the size of some equation, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's funny how people sometimes, their reaction is, oh, I can't do this, but if they just kind of plod through and try a few things, um, you'd be surprised. Um, and number five is practice. I think um, sometimes I think people have this expectation in, in STEM that you know it's just the, the teacher of the book. It's like fact, 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 fact. All these things are true, and then now you should be able to you know write a program, or now you should be able to you know uh, prove some theorem in math, or do some chemistry experiment. And it's just it, your brain just doesn't work that way, right? I mean, uh, computers do, but you know, ours don't. And it's just it's like baseball. Like you would never just tell somebody, well, like okay, that guy's going to throw the ball at you really fast, and you know, just just hit it. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, a, a lot of problem solving is like that, and um, I just want to encourage you, it, it takes time, of course, and it's, uh, I, I know it's, it's not obvious sometimes, you know, what else to take out of your life to make, make space for that, but I think um, in, in STEM I see people not really understanding just how much practice uh, you need, how much, um, you know, reading outside of class, or, or um, just, you know, even coming up with ways to uh, challenge yourself. I meant to put it in a screenshot. I actually do myself, um, there's a website called Code Wars, uh, where you can go and it'll give you little programming assignments. And it's just kind of cool. It's, uh, it's a little programming assignment. You, you fill it in, uh, you write the program, and then if you get it right, it has a bunch of test cases. Uh, then it shows you uh, other people's submissions, uh, which have been voted up to say which ones are the best. And it's pretty cool. You learn, well, heck, I didn't even know, you know Python had that thing. You know? uh, but, uh, so even, even I do that all the time. Uh, not all the time, but regularly. Uh, just kind of um, you know, stay in practice myself, even though I don't write a ton of code uh, anymore as part of my job. Cool. All right, so that's... Um, that's what I have for you today, and uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions. I know I ran over a little bit, but I think we have time, and then I can stay around a little bit uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so earlier you were talking about automating um, creation of pizzas, and that sounds really awesome, but what are your thoughts on the economic impact that automation is going to have on global jobs like that? It's unfortunate. There's two things that uh, kind of remove leverage um, from uh, you know, certain classes of labor. Um, uh, one is AI, and the other is just kind of this uh, gig economy, right, where uh, you might not have a full-time job anymore, it might just be shift-based. Um, and, and when you get into that, like Uber, for example, right, so when, when Uber changes the payout rate to the drivers, what are you going to do? There's just, you know, you, you, it's just your app uh, that tells you you can drive somebody right now. So uh, those two things both remove leverage that I think um, essentially labor used to have, right? There used to, you could do collective bargaining, right? You could say, you know, we're all your employees, uh, it's great that you don't want to pay us, we would prefer to make $20 an hour, <laughs> and, and you know, we need to, right? Um, so, so both automation and um, this sort of, you know, liquid employment um, kind of remove that, because the employer always has this opportunity to say, well, too bad you feel that way, I'm going to go, you know, hire this other type of person for $10 an hour or whatever. Um, so I think, um, to me, AI provokes a lot of thinking um, for, you know, a reasonable person around, um, how do you ensure, like, particularly if, if AI means there can be this abundance, uh, how do you ensure that it gets shared versus, like, it's just the 20 people who are rich enough to start robot companies uh, that get it all, right? Um, I was thinking about even, even Facebook, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, because the, the product is really, like, the whole world creates content. It's like, you know, they're all creating this media that their friends enjoy reading. Facebook, it was awesome what they built, right? This sort of central uh, technology that allows that to be distributed, but, you know, why is it that all the gains go to Facebook when all these people are doing work, right, uh, that's, that's creating that value? So I feel like there's, there's some gap in the way that things are shared right now. I've been wondering, like, why is there more of a co-op model for some of these things? Uh, in fact, uh, with Uber, um, a bunch of drivers did get together and they built an app. 
that's kind of like Uber. <laughs> so, but, but with better economics for the drivers because you don't have uh, you know the, the Uber headquarters and the you know the management that needs to uh, to make billions of dollars off of it all. So I don't know. I, I think there's there's an awful lot of machinery that's still you know kind of pushing in the direction of having a few billionaires uh, versus more fairness. Uh, but I'm hopeful that some other models evolve. Well, more jobs will be coming up um, in the construction of the world, and the maintenance Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Well, yeah, there's a hope that, I mean, it, this doesn't move so fast that there's not a way to do some training or retraining, right? Uh, the, the worry is maybe it does move really fast and then it's stuck. Uh, yeah, you have you know, uh, in the moving fast department, I think the biggest worry would be, speaking of Uber, is Uber is, you know, requested, let's say Uber one day requests from Tesla, they say, hey, we want to buy 500,000 self-driving cars and we want to just have them roam around the city and pick up people who need it, sit in charging stations when they're not used, that immediately displaces 500,000 taxi drivers. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that producing a, you can produce a self-driving car in a day when it takes, you know, a human 18 years, 16 years to grow up, then driving mm -hmm. to school. And I mean, the issue is, is as things accelerate, there's gonna be at some point, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50% unemployment for just about everything, like I said, pizzas, self-driving cars, self-driving tractor trailers, you're going, you know, across yeah. the United States with, for like FedEx, you know, not, not that they're gonna have delivery drones flying no, over the I'm totally with you, I think, um, yeah. then there's, there's a few proposals that um, uh, folks who worry about this have come up with, right? So, um, uh, there is a living wage idea, right? So can you just yeah. give everybody enough to have a decent life? Um, other, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Germany, for example, limited the number of hours uh, factory workers uh, can work in automotive because there was so much automation, right? If they didn't limit the hours, you'd have uh, unemployment. Um, a friend of mine who's uh, wrote a book about this, uh, named Jerry Kaplan, um, you know, he likes the idea of a tax credit for employing people because you know, companies are doing a service essentially to society, right? By providing employment and, and means. Um, so something, it does feel like um, something probably has to change, right? Uh, with this level of automation, it just, uh, it feels like it's uh, too unfair um, to uh, a lot of people who have uh, you know, decent jobs and uh, willingness to work. At the same time, though, I guess I feel like it's uh, conversation's often good that way. But likewise, it will also be cool if we can cure Alzheimer's. Right? <laughs> so, uh, one one company I was talking to recently, they've got this AI system that reads medical literature, and uh, it it found this thing that has been reported, but nobody ever kind of did like the next logical step uh, in synthesizing a particular chemical. And so that AI system spits out, you know, we should try this. And then this one company has biologists who then try to synthesize that. It works, and now they're in clinical trials. So, um, so there's a lot of amazing stuff happening, too. It's just that um, you know, with the amazingness, like, can't we all just you know, uh, share more? Because um, a lot of things were built kind of uh, based on abundance in the first place, right? Uh, it's just like with certain types of abundance we don't have anymore, like uh, just space. Uh, um, I should mention, there's one cool book called MANA, M-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Uh, it's actually just a, I don't know, like 80 page book or something like that. It's a, a fictional account of uh, a future of AI and an account of two different societies. Uh, one where 98% uh, of the society lives in debtors' prisons, uh, you know, manned by robot wardens, and the other, the other where everybody lives this amazing, bountiful life, and it's, they're all happy. Um, and uh, somehow or another, he chose America and Australia for the two names of those societies. But um, it's, it's a very interesting um, uh, just sort of uh, speculation on a future of AI kind of taking over uh, certain jobs. Yeah, I'm happy to see you around. Awesome. So let's give a door to our